So I'm very happy to be here. I have Irish roots, as do many people in Canada. My mother's father, my maternal grandfather, uh, our family was, well, they still are, some of them living up there in Ackle Sound, if you know where that is. It's a little teeny town way up on the north, northwest corner of Ireland. One of these times, I hope to get there and see what it's like. I think it's pretty humble beginnings. My cousin went to visit there several years ago, and he found my great aunt Catherine, who lives in a little thatched one-room cottage with peat on the floor. So my father used to joke, Arlene, there's only one way to go up for this family, and that's up. <laughs> so it's kind of fun to be back in Ireland. And yes, Pastor Edwards has been working me very diligently. In case you're wondering, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Some of you probably know where that is. My father was a preacher, a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. So I'm a preacher's kid. I don't know what those words mean to you. There's a stereotype about preacher's kids, you know. I'm a preacher's kid. I tell Pastor Edwards what that means is I'm not afraid of him. And then when I was 16, my father was asked to move to New York. And so we emigrated to the United States. And it was a culture shock. Because even though there's just this long border between Canada and the United States, they're really very different. And uh, Canada is much more British than America, of course. <laughs> and so it was a shock. And when I was 16 and my brain wasn't done yet, the kids laughed at me for the way I spoke, the way I would pronounce some words. For example, I remember asking somebody, oh, do you have a two-car or a one-car garage? We called where you put cars a garage. And they started to chuckle, and they said, what are you talking about? I said, you know, where you park cars next to the house. They said, do you mean a garage? I asked somebody where the bus schedule was. And they said, what? I said, where's the bus schedule? And they said, are you talking about a schedule? And I remember there was a little creek that ran behind Atlantic Union College where I went to school. And I said to my roommate, let's go down and take a walk by the creek. And she said, what's a creek? I said, you know, a little stream of water. No, she said, when something creaks, you sit on it and it makes a sound. So it's not always easy to move from one country to another, even if you think the countries are very similar. But I'll tell you, it's good for your brain. Unfortunately, I know not one single word of Romanian. And the pastor didn't take time to teach me even hello. So it's his problem, not mine. <laughs> All right. I've had lots of requests on how do you create new behaviors successfully with what we know about brain function. So recently, I created a new PowerPoint presentation. And you're the first person out first group outside of America that's getting to hear it. So let me give you just a little bit about the brain so we sort of start on the same page. If you put your two fists together, that's the size of your brain. And uh, one teenager came up to me and said, I must be really smart because look how big my hands are. And I had to tell him that size does not necessarily have anything to do with being smart. 
if you pulled those two hemispheres apart a little, you could see three or four bridges that let the right hemisphere talk to the left hemisphere. And that's really important, because if those two hemispheres can't talk to each other, then the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, literally. So there's a minuscule number of brains that are born without that biggest bridge called the corpus callosum. And for those people, you could say, put your right hand on your left shoulder. Okay, that's easy for us to do. We don't even think about it. But because that brain was missing that bridge, the person started to move their hand, got to the midline of the body, and that's as far as the hand would go. It would never, ever go over and touch the shoulder. So it's really kind of interesting how those two hemispheres work together. If you think of your hand as a neuron, a thinking cell, well, the palm of your hand, that could compare with the cell body of the neuron, if you remember that from biology. Your thumb would represent that one big projection that leaves that neuron. And that's how information goes out of that neuron and talks to another neuron. And that's all thinking is. One neuron is talking to another neuron. You have lots of fingers on a neuron or thinking cell. 10,000 if you have stimulated your brain. And as one neuron talks to another neuron, they never touch each other. Imagine that you were meeting somebody and you wanted to say hello, so you went to give them a fist pump, which is very common in the United States now because of infections. But you don't actually touch them. There's a space between your two fists. There's always a space between two neurons. And now you have to have neurotransmitters that take the information and swim across this synapse. I think of it as Hong Kong Harbor. And they'll dump the information now into the fingers that came out of the axon of the other neuron. It's just like Star Wars. I was talking about this to a group of high school students, and they said, this is more complicated than Star Wars. I said, it is. It's amazing. Your brain is the most amazing organ in your body, on this planet, and in our known universe. And what's exciting about living now, for me, is that we're getting so much information about how the brain functions because of brain imaging equipment. So some of what I'm going to talk to you tonight uh, comes from this really latest information. Isn't it marvelous? We've got some gurus over here that know what they're doing. And so they're going to take care of me. <laughs> the only bad thing is, I was lecturing one time, and I said something that the PA expert didn't like, and all of a sudden they had no mic. <laughs> and I tapped on it, and I said, do we have a mic problem? He said, no, I don't like what you said, so I turned you off. <laughs> so I'm really hoping you avoid turning me off tonight. <laughs> all right, steps to success in creating a new behavior. And people say, why do I need to know this? And we need to know this because every person on this planet has at least one behavior that isn't working for them, and they need to create a new one. And it's like having a map. If you know what to do to create a new behavior, you can create almost anything. It's like learning to drive a stick shift car. If you don't know how to shift, you're going to be in big trouble. So it's going to be easier to create a new behavior when you know a little bit about what happens in the brain. So there are five steps to creating a new behavior. And I always like to make a little phrase and remember that, so it helps me remember the steps. So this is my phrase. 
I took the first letter of each step and made a different word with it. So most slugs race with vigor. Do you know what a slug is? A slug is like a very slow snail. So they would never race with vigor. So when you make something that's a little crazy, your brain is much more likely to remember it than just something else. So most slugs race with vigor. All right, let's, and you could pick something else that works for your brain, but that works for mine. All right, let's talk about each one of those steps. If you want to create a new behavior, what do you do? How do you work with your brain? The first thing we need to talk about is mindset, because that's the first step. Bottom line is this. Everything starts in your brain, and it begins with a mindset, yours. If you think you can, or you think you can't, either way, you're right. Because your brain will only do what it thinks it can do. And how does your brain know what it can do? You tell it. Yes, your brain is part of you, but it's also a separate entity in a sense. So you need to tell your brain what it can do. And if you tell it what it can do, it is more likely to do it. So what's the definition of a mindset? Read with me, because if you read out loud, not only is it stimulating for your brain, 10 minutes of reading aloud today is every day is an anti-aging strategy. Did you hear that? Okay, how many of you read aloud 10 minutes a day? One, two, three, since yesterday. Good girl, you're building a new behavior. <gasps> Reading aloud 10 minutes a day is an anti-aging strategy. That's one good part because it's so stimulating to your brain. The other part is when you read aloud, the information tends to go directly into long-term memory. And you're much more likely to be able to recall it when you want to. So read aloud with me, the first paragraph. Mindset definition. A mental attitude or disposition that predetermines your responses. A set of opinions about something that strongly influences your inclinations. All right, what's an example of that? A mental attitude or disposition that predetermines your responses. So let's say that you have learned that it's very good for your brain and body if you drink a big glass of water 30 minutes before you eat a meal. Because that makes sure that you're not eating because you're thirsty, because you've drunk the water. You're eating because your body really needs the food and you tend to not overeat. If your mental attitude or mindset is, it's better for me if I drink a big glass of water 30 minutes before a meal, you're much more likely to do it. It predetermines your responses because you believe that, you have initiated that behavior. So changing or creating a new behavior starts with your mindset. What is it that you have decided you believe and that you are going to do? I like the iceberg metaphor because the brain learns fastest with a metaphor. So here's a picture of an iceberg. Any of you ever seen an iceberg in real life? I went up to British Columbia not too long ago to visit some of my relatives, and their house is on the San Juan Strait that separates the mainland of Vancouver with Vancouver Island. And we were just looking out the window one day, and here comes this great big iceberg floating down. I'd never seen a, a real one before. And it didn't look very big. And I said, oh, that's not a very big iceberg. 
but I'm seeing an iceberg. How neat. And my cousin looked at me, and he said, that's a huge iceberg. He says, look what's sticking up above the water. It's like a, a huge semi-trailer. And I said, what? So he went to the internet and pulled up a picture and said, most of it is under the water. You don't see it. That's what hit the Titanic and sank the Titanic. You only see a little bit. OK, here's the metaphor for your brain. Your conscious mind, the part where you can, you know what you're thinking. You know, I can tell you, my name is Arlene Taylor. I know where I was born. I know where I am now. I know I'm talking to you. That's your conscious mind. It represents this little bit that's sticking up above the water. But my subconscious mind is this huge portion that's under the water that I'm not always aware of. But it thinks, even though I'm not thinking consciously. The massive subconscious mind has an uncanny sense of whether or not you mean business. So if you say to yourself, well, you know, research says I should drink a big glass of water before I eat a meal. That's probably true, but. I don't know if it would do me much good, you know. If I feel like it, I will. Your brain is not going to build a new behavior because it knows you're not serious. It only helps you build a new behavior if it senses you are really serious about this. So that's what the first step is. What's your mindset? Are you really serious about doing this behavior? There are two mindsets in the literature. One is called a fixed mindset, and one is called a growth mindset. And if you want to do a new behavior, you need a growth mindset. People with a fixed mindset believe that however they came into the world, that's who they are. They can't change. They often feel like, well, look at me. I can't be successful. This is how I am. You know, came from a really uh, uneducated family. My mother was the first female in 15 generations who ever went to college. So a lot of people think, oh, can't do this. Well, you can't if you have a fixed mindset because it says it's hopeless. I am who I am. Can't do anything about it. So dump that one and develop a growth mindset which says you can change and improve through application, rehearsal, experience, vigilance, and course correction. And anybody who ever learns to do something new does so because they have a growth mindset. And that's what you need in order to change behavior. So Dr. Dweck, who has written the book, Mindset, says having a growth mindset doesn't force you to pursue something. It just tells you that you can develop your skills if you want to. It's still up to you whether or not you want to. And I want to. I love this information. So where does a mindset come from? Hmm probably starts two or three or four generations back because you get what's called cellular memory from your ancestors about their behaviors. But certainly it begins during pregnancy because sound is the first sensory system to develop in a little fetus. And we know from research that when the baby's born, it recognizes voices that it heard often during pregnancy. And if the mother and father played uh, songs over and over again, it'll recognize that song after it's born. One of the most amazing things that ever happened to me as a student nurse, I was in a delivery room with the, the mother and the father and the doctor. And here comes this 
cute little baby girl born. And she started to, to cry and scream and kick her little legs and acted like she wasn't happy. I think I would have been delighted to be out of that birth canal. <laughs> so her father calmly walked over and he put his hand on the baby's arm and he said, Angela, this is your dad speaking. You're just fine. You're safe. We're so happy to have you here. She stopped crying instantly and focused her little eyes on the sound of that voice. And the doctor said, did you talk to her a lot while she was, your wife was pregnant? He said, every day. He said, well, she obviously knows your voice. That is such a sweet, sweet story to be. So you develop your mindset from what you hear people say to you. Angela, I'm glad you're here. I'm your father. From what you hear people say about you, and that's why you need to go back and think about that. Did people tell you, you can do it. The sky's the limit. We'll help you do it. Or did they say to you, you're too dumb to do that. What did they tell you? Because if they told you you were too dumb to do it, you probably developed a fixed mindset. But the good news is you can change that just because that that's what you heard. You don't have to believe that. You do not have to believe everything anyone tells you about yourself. And you develop a growth mindset by watching your parents and the people took care, who took care of you. And how did they behave? Did they say, you know, I think there are more opportunities for us in America than there are in Canada, so we're going to move to America. Certainly that was a huge benefit for me when my father and mother decided they would emigrate to the United States. Because I doubt I would be a brain function specialist today if I had stayed in Canada. Because there is a different expectation for women in Canada than there is in the United States. So I'm delighted that they moved to the United States. I still go back to Canada, although they changed the flag, so it doesn't feel the same. I mean, I used to salute the Union Jack in the corner of the Canadian flag. And sometime after I moved to America, they changed the flag. Do you know what it looks like now? It's a maple leaf. Okay, I like maple trees, but what in the world is a maple leaf? I have no emotional connection to the maple leaf. None, what's, none whatsoever. So when I see the maple leaf, it's no big deal. But when I see the old Canadian flag, I can almost start to tear up. Because I saluted that flag for 16 years. Studies with four-year-olds. This is huge. Because the brain matures from the back to the front. And there's not a lot. I mean, the brain is growing really quickly. But when you're four, you know, there's not a lot of development that's made. So the teacher says to this group of four-year-olds, you have a choice, and choice is important. I encourage you to start giving your children choices from the time they're tiny. Two choices only, because you only have two hemispheres. And it doesn't matter what they are. It can be really simple. You know, I told one mother, take a fork with a blue handle and a fork with a red handle and hold them both, both up and say to the one-year-old, which fork do you want? doesn't matter to you, but give them a choice so they start learning to make choices. And if they pick the red one, you put the blue one away. That was their choice for today. Another day, they might make a different choice. So the teacher said, you have a choice. They had just done a jigsaw puzzle that was very easy to do. And the teacher said, you can do another easy jigsaw puzzle or redo this one. Or you can try a harder jigsaw puzzle. Then they watch what the kids would choose. And children with a fixed mindset 
chose to redo the puzzle that they had just done because they wanted to look smart. And if you've already done it once, it's, it's easier to do it again. The kids with the growth mindset chose the new harder puzzle so they could stretch themselves and become smarter. Can you see how that would work? Now they grow up and they're in a job and there's something they've never done before and they have the option to do that and maybe get more education in advance, but they don't want to do that. They just want to do really good at what they know so they appear smarter. Because when you learn something new, you don't learn it instantly. You'll make mistakes and so on. But it's good for you to stretch your brain. You're only going to do that if you have a growth mindset. There's a book written called Peter Pan. It's an imaginary story about a boy who could fly. And the author made this statement that so aligns with current brain function information. He said, the moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease forever to be able to do it. The moment you doubt that you can learn to do something, you probably never learn to do it. The moment you doubt that you can create a new healthier behavior, your brain isn't going to help you do it. Because your brain can only do what it thinks it can do. And how does it know what it can do? You tell it. So what do you want to do? Doctors Tanzi and Chopra wrote a book called Super Brain recently. They're brain function researchers. And this is what they say. What do you want to do? What behavior do you know would improve your life? Maybe make you more healthy. Uh, make your relationships better. Maybe help you get a better job. If you are not serious and think you can't, or if metaphorically you're just sitting on the fence, eh, not sure which way to go, your brain won't help you. And that's where we get this saying that I love, your brain can only do what it thinks it can do. And you tell it what it can do. How do you tell it what it can do? Brand new research about that. So here is a cutaway, if you will, of the brain. So this thinking part of the brain I just took it and put it on a scanner, took a picture of it, then I cut it up and pulled the sections apart so that you could see that there's three functional layers of the brain. You can even think of it as your left, your left wrist is this first or reptilian layer. And then if you made a fist out of your left hand, your fist would be that second or mammalian layer. And then here's that cerebrum, gray matter, cortex. And that's where you have some conscious thought, but not a lot. So the human brain was designed to deal easily with positive statements. They're a one part process. They tell you exactly what to do. Easy for the brain to do that. So if I were to say to Pastor Edwards, stand up and come over here, I need you. That's considered a one-part positive statement. I have told him exactly what to do. And that's what we need to tell the brain because it does best with that. And, f and this is, you can find this all in scripture. So those of you who study scripture, go read the Lord's Prayer whole thing is written in positives, only tells you what to do. Easy for the brain. Because everything you read, think, hear, the words are changed into pictures in your mind. And these subconscious layers don't use language, any language. But they can see the pictures that are formed in this part of your brain by what you say, and they follow the pictures. 
And that's the reason it has to be positive and present tense. Because a negative statement tells your brain what not to do, but it doesn't tell you what to do. So if I say to you, don't think about the white bear, it tells you not to do what? Think about the white bear. But your brain's already made a picture of the white bear, and it's in working memory. So that's all you're going to want to think about is the white bear. It does not tell you what to do. So the first thing you need to be really clear about is if you want to change a behavior, avoid ever telling yourself don't do that behavior because you'll put the picture in your brain and that's all you're going to want to do. The first and second layers aren't very good at reversing the picture. Sometimes it's easy. If I say to you, don't touch the stove, what's the first picture? Touching the stove. But don't is supposed to tell you, don't touch the stove. But your brain has to convert that picture and Logically, it would be keep your hand away from the stove. But sometimes the brain, those two layers miss the don't and they fail to get the picture converted. So you say to a seven-year-old kid, don't touch the stove. Already made the picture of touching the stove, touches the stove and gets burned because the subconscious follows the picture. Now we punish the kid for touching the stove. Whose fault was it? We gave him the wrong picture to follow. So you tell the child, keep your hand away from the stove. That's a positive instruction. That's the picture. And you've got about an 85% chance that the child will keep their hand away from the stove. It's not 100%, but 85 is a really good average. This comes from work by a researcher named Dr. Daniel Wegner. And he talks about this for one part, two part self-talk, or one step, two step. So don't think about the white bear. Is that a one step or a two step process? It's a two step process and very difficult for the brain to follow. For adults, you tell yourself, I don't want to do that. And what do you end up doing? What you just told yourself you didn't want to do. So start telling yourself only what you do want to do. Always in a positive, never in a negative. And this is what he says. When you say, don't think about the white bear, a representation of a white bear goes into your brain's working memory and you will likely think about it even more frequently. And I had a really sharp kid in a college freshman class I was teaching one time. And uh, I said, don't think about the white bear. And he immediately said, OK, Dr. Taylor, tell me what you want me to think about. I said, good for you. And one of the other students said, oh, probably a brown bear or a black bear. And he said, only if she wants me to think about a bear. I thought that was brilliant. All right, so positive self-talk, that's step two. Once you've got your mindset and you're sure what you're going to do and you're telling your brain this is what we are doing, then stop talking about what you don't want to have happen. Totally ignore it. Only talk about what you want to have happen as if it's a done deal. Speak as if the desired behavior is already in place and happening right now. Critical for altering behaviors, creating a new behavior. Use short, positive, present tense words. Now, supposing that you've decided, you've learned that drinking sodas, regular or diet, is not good for your brain and immune system, and it isn't. If you say, don't drink sodas, what's the picture? Drinking sodas, absolutely. 
So you would say your first name followed by a you because you are talking to your brain. Maria, you drink only water today. You like the taste, you feel good. Only tell it what you are doing, even if you haven't started doing it yet. So we got a group of kids together and we had them walk along a two by four. And every time somebody called out, don't fall, somebody fell off the two by four because there's the picture of falling. Well, Mark, you are walking the plank successfully. You are having fun. Almost always they made it to the end of the plank. Parents, teachers, and caregivers who are patient teach children the unemotional, useful, step-by-step -step language for mastering any task through role modeling effective self-talk and talking to others. And then the children start learning to do that for themselves. And that's often, if they've got parents and teachers like that, that's often how the next generation gets more successful than the first one. So the, you might hear the child say, Jack or Jill, you can do it. Try again. And that's what the well-taught child is more likely to say to him or herself if you're role modeling talking like this. There was an amazing study by a researcher called uh, Ethan Cross. Took a group of students, high school students, divided them into two groups, and he said to them, all right, here's your assignment. You have five minutes to prepare to give a five-minute speech. They told one group, tell yourself, I am giving a speech. The other group, you say, Arlene, you're giving a speech and you're doing a good job. Then they actually had them do the speech and they brought in um, judges to judge independently the speeches and this is what they found. Participants using their given name and the word you, talking to their brain, performed better on the speech, engaged in far less rumination after saying, ooh, I didn't do such a good job, that was embarrassing, I knew I couldn't do it. Uh, experienced less depression, perceived less shame for mistakes they made, and on and on and on. But those using I and me felt inadequate and gave poor speeches. So that's the research. So learn how to talk to yourself. Dr. Cross says, your brain is a sponge. You know what a sponge is? It soaks up water. Well, your brain soaks up what it hears, what it reads, what it sees. And when you use I and me, it hooks into your self-esteem level. So if you have poor levels of self-esteem, I don't think I'm very good at this, I'm not sure I can do this, I don't know how smart I am, you usually do a much poorer job. So using first name and you empowers the participants so that what others see as a threat, they view as a challenge. And that works for anybody of any age. When you talk to others, you tend to talk to them the way you talk to yourself. And you may not realize that, but you do, statistically. So first of all, you teach yourself to, to talk to yourself in ways that get your brain's attention. And then you're more likely to talk to other people like that. And again, it's don't forget your homework and what's the picture? Forgetting your homework. Or, Mary, put your homework in your book bag. Uh, don't miss the target. And the picture is throwing the dart and missing the target versus, Jim, aim for the bullseye. You might not hit it every time, but statistically, you'll get a lot closer to it than if you tell a child, don't miss the target. This was an interesting one. I don't want to yell at my children. Or, Jill, you speak kindly to the children. 
And this lady come to visit me in my office, and she said, I'm a screamer, always screaming at my kids. I realized uh, yesterday that I don't want them to grow up with memories of their mothers just screaming at them. And I tell myself, I don't want to yell at my kids. And I turn around and yell at my kids. So I said, every time you say, I don't want to yell at my kids, what picture did she put in her brain? Yelling at her kids. I said, you need to say, Jill, you speak kindly to your children. She said, but I don't. I said, well, start. Jill, you speak kindly to your children. I said, you're still going to have to use willpower. But you put a picture in your brain of speaking kindly to your children instead of screaming at them like a banshee. Three, rehearse and rehearse. So pick a new behavior. That one was a new behavior for me, drinking a glass of water before I eat. So I describe the new behavior to myself. I say, Arlene, you're going to drink a big glass of water before every meal. You know that that's going to keep you from having a dehydrated brain that's shrinking away from your skull, which is an ugly thought. And it puts the picture in there of reminding you to drink a big glass of water before each meal. So then you actually rehearse the behavior. Lunch is coming up. Oh, yes, glass of water. Tea is coming up. Oh, yes, glass of water. You actually do the behavior in real time. But here's the next piece. You picture the behavior in your mind's eye. And even when you're not actually drinking the water, periodically you see yourself in your mind's eye going to get a glass of water and drinking it before you eat, about 30 minutes before you eat. So you are reinforcing the actual practice with virtual practice, and it'll make it go twice as fast. If you've been on a boat or a ferry or anything like that, usually there's a lifeboat drill if it's a big one. I was on the QE2 some years ago lecturing on a trip from New York up to New Brunswick. So the very first thing they had us do was go to our cabin and get our life jackets and climb up to our particular assigned place on the deck, put our life jacket on, and then they told us, look around. If we have an emergency, then this is where you go, grab your life jacket, and you come here. And that's called actual rehearsal. When I got on the plane in San Francisco to fly over to London, they didn't have the oxygen masks drop from the ceiling. They said to us, in the event of an unexpected landing, don't you like those words? Unexpected landing? I don't want an unexpected landing. <laughs> in the event of an unexpected landing, oxygen masks will drop from the ceiling. What are you supposed to do with them? If you have a child with you, what are you supposed to do with them? Put it on the child? No, you put it on your own face first so you get the oxygen and you can stay clear enough then to help the child. And so they go through this. It's not really happening. But in your brain, you make that picture. Here comes the oxygen mask. Put it on me first and then take the oxygen mask and help my grandmother or my child or whoever's next to me. Sometimes it might be another adult who's just gone ballistic. They're so terrified. You'll need to help get the, but get it on yourself first. So when you are learning a new behavior, reinforce the actual rehearsal with virtual rehearsal. And let me give you one example of how that happens because it increases the rate at which you learn. How many of you play the piano? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Good. Two hands. Oh, you can play with two hands. 
<laughs> Very good. How many of you play another instrument just for interest's sake? Okay, what do you play? The accordion. Oh, there's a lot of organ, famous organists who started on accordions. You play on... I'm talking about a musical instrument. <laughs> Anybody else play a musical instrument? What do you play? The recorder. My boys played recorders. Come on. Isn't Romania very musical? Isn't that a musical com country? Okay, so everybody needs to be learning to play a musical instrument. It's very, very good for your brain. It age-proofs your brain. So find an instrument and find somebody to help you learn and start tomorrow if you don't know how. All right, so what they did was took two kids about the same age who were taking piano lessons and they were about the same ability at the moment. And they asked one of them, here's a piece of music, I want you to actually practice the piano for two hours a day for seven days. And they did a brain scan before the child started practicing for those 14 hours. And when the child was done, they did another brain scan and they could actually see in the brain's cortex how it had reshaped itself to learn that piece of music after just 14 hours of practice. Then they took another child and they said to them, here's the piece of music. We don't want you to go near the piano for the next seven days. But we want you to prop this piece of music up maybe on your bureau. And we want you to spend two hours a day for seven days just looking at that music and in your mind's eye, imagining that you're playing it. And they took a PET scan before he started and after he started, and the virtual piano practice caused the same reshaping of the brain's motor cortex. So, do the practicing, really, and then do it in your mind's eye, and you will accelerate the rate at which you learn, amazing. When you are learning a new behavior, live a balanced lifestyle. Avoid exhaustion. Get enough sleep for your brain because every period of exhaustion is followed by a corresponding period of depression and the exhaustion tends to lower levels of a neurotransmitter called serotonin. And you need a certain amount of serotonin to be happy. And so as that falls, you can get depressed. And then it's really hard to learn a new behavior when you're depressed. I don't know if anybody's been depressed, but if you're depressed, you just don't feel like doing anything. So if you're learning, trying to learn a new behavior and you get exhausted and then you get depressed, it's gonna be more difficult for you to learn. All right, willpower. Willpower is such an interesting mental faculty. Willpower is believed to be housed right behind your, your forehead. And it's n that part of the brain isn't done until mid to late 20s. So this would be right behind the forehead, and that's where we believe willpower is. But that part of the brain takes a long time to develop. So hopefully you've been making choices and learning how to use willpower even when you're very little so that when that finally gets done, you've got the skills already built and now your willpower can help you be successful. This is what willpower is unable to help you do in general. Willpower rarely, if ever, works well to deprive yourself of something you already do for gratification 
like ending a bad habit, especially one that involves addictive behaviors. So people who don't understand this, someone's trying to quit smoking, for example, and they'll say, well, use your willpower. Okay, willpower is not designed to help you quit smoking because you get a reward from that. It might kill you in the end, but at the moment you get a reward from it. Willing yourself not to do something, it's just, again, don't think about the white bear. It puts that right in working memory and that's all you think about. Willpower is designed to give you energy and perseverance to attain a specific goal. And that might be a brand new behavior you've never done before, like you're all gonna start learning to play a musical instrument, right? So that's a new behavior. Or to develop a healthier replacement behavior, because that was giving you negative outcomes, that's what willpower can help you do. But you only talk about what you are doing now as if it's a done deal, and you never talk about what you don't want to do anymore because you want to avoid putting that picture in working memory. How long is this going to take? Doesn't happen instantly. I have come to the conclusion from research that probably about 12 weeks is what you're going to need to have to really implement a new behavior and have it in place. Lots of research about that. In some researchers, uh, in some research studies, the average time it took for somebody to build a brand new behavior and get it really in place was 66 days. And so just some took longer than that, some took a little less, but in the Longevity Lifestyle Matters program that I now run, it's a 12-week program because we've got the research that takes about that long to really get the program in place. But if you do this, by the end of 12 weeks, the behavior is usually firmly in place, and then eventually it'll be stronger than the one you're replacing, if it's a replacement behavior, or your new behavior will be pretty much in place. And then you just keep on doing it for the rest of your life. So step number five, be vigilant. I like that word, vigilant. Isn't that what the the 10 virgins with their oil lamps were told to be vigilant. Pay attention, stay aware. Awareness is your choice. And there's an interesting little phrase that says, awareness is the first step on the continuum of positive change. You have to be aware of what it is you want to do and go through the process. So you're building a new behavior. You're drinking a big glass of water before every meal. Stay aware and make sure you do it. Train yourself to notice. If halfway through that meal, you, oh, I didn't drink, that's that's awareness that's happening really quickly. You don't want to wait three weeks from now to remember that, oh, I'm forgetting to drink before my meal. You want to be aware of that quickly so you can course correct. So you realize that, oops, I didn't drink before my meal today. So what are you going to do to help remind yourself? Maybe you're going to leave a glass right out there on the table. Maybe you're going to put a sign there that says, drink a glass of water 30 minutes before you eat, whatever it takes to remind yourself. If you're, let's say that you've decided that um, eating half a gallon of ice cream at night in front of television is not doing you any good, and I work with a lot of people who do that, Get ice cream out of your environment. Had a woman who was trying to live healthier. 
and I and she was really morbidly obese, meaning she was so heavy that she was going to shorten her life span if she didn't do something about it. So she came to see me and she said, you know, I've been weighing myself every week and I've been eating more healthfully, but I've gained a pound in the last week and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. <clears throat> I said, well, this week, I handed her a piece of paper. I want you to write down every day everything you eat. And then bring it back and let's look at it. And let's see if what you're eating is not what's recommended. Oh, she said, I'm eating really healthfully. I said, okay, fine. Do it. Bring it back. Comes back in a week. Hands me the piece of paper. It's all filled out. She said, that was a lot of work. I said, well, let me look at it. So I start going down the list. And I come to an entry that says, ice cream, two bowls. It's on every night of the week. I said, tell me about the ice cream. Oh, she said that. Well, you know, I do like a little treat at night while I'm watching television. I said, do you know how much, do you know how much fat is in ice cream and how much sugar? No wonder you're gaining a pound. Two bowls every single night is a lot of ice cream. How serious are you about this? And she goes, well, I'm just using it up. I said, what? She says, I'm just using it up. She said, there was a sale on ice cream, and I filled my freezer with ice cream. Oh, I don't want to waste it. I said, you are wasting it. It's going directly to your waist. <laughs> if you want to change that behavior, get that ice cream out of your environment. There's night and day difference between running to the freezer and here's all this ice cream and having to get in the car and drive to a store and buy some ice cream. I said, how serious are you about this? Oh. Well, she said, my mother told me not to waste anything. I said, don't. Give it away to people who don't care. But if you care, get it out of your environment. So she comes back to me and she says, I did it. I said, what did you do? She says, I found an orphanage. And they needed an, a freezer. And I gave them my freezer. And I gave them all the ice cream at the same time. She said, I don't know what they're going to do with it, but it's out of my house. So if you are doing a new behavior, get rid of everything related to that behavior that's going to make you unsuccessful. I say that vigilance is the price of success. So you forget to drink water for this meal. Okay, get right back on the program. So you made a misstep. You know, some people will say, oh, I forgot to drink water both at, at lunch and tea today, so it's hopeless. Are you nuts? You made a boo-boo. Start all over again quickly. Keep your self-talk positive. Thank your brain for helping you. You might say, Arlene, you're remembering to drink water before every meal. Thank you, brain, for helping me. I mean, your brain loves to be thanked. How often do you thank your brain for helping you do stuff? Have you ever thanked your brain for helping you do stuff? Well, that's kind of depressing. Do you like to be thanked? Thank your brain. I mean, it's an amazing organ. Janet, your brain's helping you be successful. It's fun being successful. And then enjoy it. So there you go. Most slugs race with vigor. Get your mindset, a growth mindset. Decide what it is the behavior is that you want to do. Talk to yourself the way researchers have found that enhances your risk for being successful. Arlene? You are drinking a glass of water before every meal. You're keeping your brain hydrated. 
Rehearse. Every day you do it. If you forget for a meal, do something to help you remind, help remind you for the next meal. Use your willpower to help you do the behavior. Forget what you don't want to do. Concentrate on what you do want to do. And then stay aware. Awareness is vigilance is what you need for success and being aware of what you're doing is part of that. Okay, have you got it? Now, I know that every one of you in this room has some behavior that you would like to develop or tweak because that's the human condition. So this is what we have found works. And I think, oh, let's finish up with this because I do love this. When my mother died, she was a school teacher. My mother was a school teacher. When she died, I was cleaning out her desk, and I found this poem. I wish I knew who wrote it, but it's the very best poem I've ever found that talks about how powerful habits are, which means that it can be a struggle to change a habit. But once you've done it, or once you've built a new habit, you've got it. You got the software. Which brings me to one caution. Be careful what you do once. Because whenever you do something once, the brain makes no judgment about whether that's good or bad or helpful or unhelpful or right or wrong or desirable. It just says, oh, well, you did this. Okay, I'm going to start a piece of software here so that if you ever want to do that again, it'll be easier for you to do it a second time. Do you get that? So if you don't think the behavior that you're considering is something that you really want to do that will be good for your brain and body, never do it once. Because the minute you've done it once, you've got the software, which always makes it easier to do again. So let's finish up by reading this poem together. It's called, I Am Habit. It is mighty hard to shake me. In my brawny arms I take thee. I can either make or break thee, I am habit. Through each day I slowly mold thee, soon my tightening chains enfold thee, then it is with ease I hold thee, I am habit. I can be both good and vile. I can e'er be worth your while or the cause of your decryal, I am habit. Oft I've proved myself a pleasure, proved myself a priceless treasure, or a menace past all measure. I am habit. Harmless though I sometimes seem, yet my strange force is like a magnet, like a great and greedy dragnet. I am habit. Though you sometimes fear or doubt me, no one yet has lived without me. I am present all about thee. I am habit. Choose me well when you are starting. Seldom is an easy parting. I'm a devil or a darling. I am habit. Isn't that a marvelous poem? Love it. So there you go. Now you know the steps that researchers say help you to develop a brand new behavior or a healthier replacement behavior. I'm pretty sure these are on my website, but I'll double check so that you can go back and get the PowerPoints anytime you want to refresh your memory. And you can do almost anything that you really want to do. If it's something that a human being is capable of doing by just following the steps and have fun doing it.